Good morning, Conquest of Doers. I'm still struggling to get chapters 6 and 7 of uh, Conquest of Doe down on paper. Um, although events in the Middle East are uh, helping just to sort of gel some of the themes. Um, this is a blog which uh, I'm going to publish later. Uh, but first of all, I want to read the third Philippic of um, uh, Dem Demosthenes, uh, Demosthenes um, and uh, it's a celebrated piece of oratory um, in opposition to Philip of Macedonia, who was Alexander the Great's father. Um, Philip of Macedonia was marching about the place, invading people, and Demosthenes Denise was basically uh, discussing with Athenians other alliances which they might uh, uh, endow, uh, uh, um, in actually participate in or encourage or, or, or husband as it were um, to uh, head Philip of Macedonia off at the pass um, and it's a very interesting piece um, and I've cast it um, as our orator, our champion in the face of the tyrant Trump. Now, Donald Trump and other village idiots of the Washington Clown Consensus, uh, Macron, May, Johnson, Trudeau, Merkel, um, whoever the current incumbent in Australia is, uh, the list goes on, the idiots in Brussels, um, who you know continue to uh, prance, flounce, and otherwise luxuriate in their overblown plumage of pomposity. Um, and uh, where is the fourth estate? Where is the media to challenge the the whoppers, the porkies, the huge lies which just spew forth? Uh, they're amplified by the media, they're not um, tackled, engaged with and um, rebutted as they, as they should be in a healthy democratic state. Um, first up, um, uh, I thought we ought to put in a little bit of a defence from our friend Lucian. Um, uh, these words in support of the idiot tyrant. Um, this is taking from uh, Phalaris 1 uh, on the screen here. Uh, Phalaris 1, um, it's works of Lucium of Semasvata. Um, just to say what it is, this oration as well as Phalaris 2 um, seems to be merely declamatory, written by Lucian as a rhetorical piece. Its object is to say as much in favour of the tyrant of Ag Agrigentum Phalaris as possible, given his tyrannical reputation. Uh, the piece can be considered an argumentative oration, not without merit as a rhetorical piece. Uh, Lucian pleads the cause, the cause with warmth and energy and supports Phalaris as best as a character like Phalaris can be. Um, and I've taken just one of those, one of these paragraphs in my. Uh, uh, introduction which seems to fit the uh, the script as it were um, and uh, this is, these are the words of Philaris uh, put in his mouth by Lucian I found the city in a ruinous condition owing to the neglect of the magistrates who had commonly been guilty of embezzlement if not of wholesale plunder I repaired the evil by means of aqueducts beautified the city with noble buildings and surrounded it with walls the public revenues were easily increased by proper attention on the part of the fiscal authorities. I provided for the education of the young and the maintenance of the old, and for the general public. I had games and spectacles, banquets and doles. As for rape and seduction, tyrannical violence or intimidation, I abhorred the very name of such things. Um, well, that kind of sets the scene, and you can... Uh, uh, take from that what you will for parallels, um, tongue-in-cheek references to golden showers and the like, uh, dossiers and dodgy or otherwise golden showers and uh, um, pussy-grabbing 
village idiot and other uh, buffoonery um, which you can take equally to a, apply to Donald Trump himself uh, president of clowns or indeed that other a bumbling idiot of politics uh, one Boris Johnson um, so anyway I, I then get the Wikipedia article up on what a Philippic is uh, and it talks about um, uh, Demosthenes and this Philippic I'm about to read uh, and goes on to say how Cicero the great Roman orator based many of his own um, condemnations of Mark Antony on um, uh, the, the, the Philippics so that goes on there and then we come to the Trump address uh, so let's just have a little bit of that just to get us in the mood thank you very much my fellow Americans as president of the United States my highest obligation is to ensure the safety and security of the American people. History has shown that the longer we ignore a threat, the more dangerous that threat becomes. For this reason, upon taking office, I've ordered a complete strategic review of our policy toward the rogue regime in Iran. That review is now complete. Today I am announcing our strategy, along with several major steps we are taking to confront the Iranian regime's hostile actions and to ensure that Iran never, and I mean never, acquires a nuclear weapon. Our policy is based on a clear-eyed assessment of the Iranian dictatorship, its sponsorship of terrorism, and its continuing aggression in the Middle East and all around the world. Iran is under the control of a fanatical regime that seized power in 1979 and forced a proud people to submit to its extremist rule. This radical regime has raided the wealth of one of the world's oldest and most vibrant nations and spread death, destruction, and chaos all around the globe. Beginning in 1979, agents of the Iranian regime illegally seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and held more than 60 Americans hostage during the 444 days of the crisis. The Iranian-backed terrorist group Hezbollah twice bombed our embassy in Lebanon, once in 1983 and again in 1984. Another Iranian-supported bombing killed 241 Americans. Service members they were in their barracks in Beirut in 1983. In 1996, the regime directed another bombing of American military housing in Saudi Arabia, murdering 19 Americans in cold blood. Iranian proxies provided training to operatives who were later involved in Al-Qaeda's bombing of the American embassies in Kenya, Tanzania, and two years later killing 224 people and wounding more than 4,000 others. I think that's probably enough of President Trump, who's clearly struggling to read his autocue there, Tanzania and all. Uh, the man is uh, just, he's not improving in office. If anything, he's going backwards. Um, uh, do watch the whole thing. I have watched the whole thing, and it's risible. Um, whoever wrote his flashcards for him and just stood there holding up their finger to the pictures um, it's a cartoon a caricature uh, it's an insult to all of the talented american diplomats around the world 
who have probably been either sidelined, thrown out of jobs and all the rest of it. Um, also all of the good people in the American uh, administration uh, and you'll find them everywhere in the lower levels of these places. Um, they don't advance because they simply don't blow smoke up the arse of idiots like this. Um, I had high hopes for Donald Trump that he'd actually bring a businessman's mind to uh, uh, affairs and some good old fashioned American pragmatism but um, as we see uh, he's just determined to blow smoke up Netanyahu's arse uh, and they obviously have a kind of a good circular thing sort of uh, going on. Um, anyway, the third Philippic, which is considered to be the, the best of uh, the four which um, uh, have come down to us from Demosthenes. Um, and here we are. Uh, w this takes us back to 343 BC. Um, and uh, Philip II of Macedonia turned his military activities towards Thrace. Um, and uh, so forth. So anyway, you can read that. Um, you know, that will be on the blog. Uh, but what I want to do now is actually just read this, uh, this oratory. So uh, the third Philippic is considered the best of Demosthenes that Demosthenes political orations because of its passionate and evocative style. From the moment he delivered the third Philippic, Demosthenes imposed himself as the most influential politician of Athens and the Caesarean of, of the Athenian political arena. He takes the offensive and devitalizes the Pacific and pro-Macedonian faction of Ashenese in the Third Philippic, the unchallengeable and passionate leader of the anti-Macedonian faction gives the signal for the Athenian uprising against Philip. Um, now, let's just uh, do this quickly. So, a sovereign or state having some control over another state that is internally autonomous. And there you go, it's kind of like a, a vassal state is, is what uh, Caesarean is. Um, so, this is uh, the English translation by J.H. Vince and um, I take this from this website here um, which uh, you can see all the paragraphs uh, as you go through and I, what I've done is just put them all into a blog so they can be read sort of uh, as a piece as it were. So here we are, I now adorn myself with the uh, uh, personality of Demosthenes and uh, here is the third Philippic. Many speeches are delivered, men of Athens, at almost every meeting of the assembly about the wrongs that Philip has been committing. Ever since the conclusion of peace, not only against you, but also against the other states, and all the speakers would, I am sure, admit in theory, though they do not put it in practice, that the object both of our words and deeds must be to check and chastise his arrogance. Yet I perceive that all our interests have been so completely betrayed and sacrificed that I am afraid it is an ominous thing to say, but yet the truth, even if all who address you had wanted to propose and all of you had wanted to pass measures that were bound to bring our affairs into the worst possible plight, I do not think they could have been in a worse condition than they are today. Perhaps indeed this condition of our affairs may be attributed to many causes and not just to one or two. But a careful examination will convince you that it is above all due to those who study to win your favour rather than to give you the best advice. Some of them Athenians, interested in maintaining a system which brings them credit and influence, have no thought for the future, and therefore think 
you should have none either. While others, by blaming and traducing those in authority, make it their sole aim that our city shall concentrate her attention on punishing her own citizens, while Philip shall be free to say and do whatever he pleases. But such methods of dealing with public affairs, familiar though they are to you, are the cause of your calamities. I claim for myself, Athenians, that if I utter some home truths with freedom, I shall not thereby incur your displeasure. For look at it this way, in other matters you think it is so necessary to grant general freedom of speech to everyone in Athens, that you even allow aliens and slaves to share in the privilege and many more menials may be observed among you, speaking their minds with more liberty than citizens enjoy in other states. But from your deliberations, you have banished it utterly. Hence the result is that in the assembly, your self-complacency is flattered by hearing none but pleasant speeches. But your policy and your practice are already involving you in the gravest peril. Therefore, if such is your temper now, I have nothing to say, but if, apart from flattery, you are willing to hear something to your advantage, I am ready to speak. For though the state of our affairs is in every way deplorable, and though much has been sacrificed, nevertheless it is possible, if you choose to do your duty, that all may yet be prepared. And what I am going to say may perhaps seem a paradox, but it is true. The worst feature of the past is our best hope for the future. What then is that feature? It is that your affairs go wrong because you neglect every duty, great or small, since surely if they were in this plight in spite of your doing all that was required, there would not even a hope of improvement but in fact it is your indifference and carelessness that Philip has conquered. Your city he has not conquered, nor have you been defeated. No, you have not even made a move. If then we were all agreed that Philip is at war with Athens and is violating the peace, the only task of a speaker would be to come forward and recommend the safest and easiest method of defence. But since some of you are in such a strange mood that, though Philip is seizing cities and retaining many of your possessions and inflicting injury on everybody, you tolerate some speakers who repeatedly assert in the assembly that the real aggressors are certain of ourselves. We must be on our guard and set this matter right. For there is a grave danger that anyone who proposes and urges that we shall defend ourselves may incur the charge of having provoked the war. I therefore first of all state and define this question whether it is in our power to discuss the alternative of peace or war. If indeed Athens can remain at peace and if the choice rests with us to take that point first I personally feel that we are bound to do so and if anyone says that we can I call upon him to move a resolution and to do something and to play us no tricks. But if there is another person concerned with sword in hand and a mighty force at his back who imposes on you with the name of peace but himself indulges in acts of war, what is left but to defend ourselves? If you choose to follow his example and profess that you are at peace, I raise no objection. But if anyone mistakes for peace an arrangement which will enable Philip when he has seized everything else to march upon us, he has taken leave of his senses, and the peace that he talks of is one that you observe toward Philip, and not Philip towards you. That is the advantage which he is purchasing by all his expenditure of money, that he should be at war with you, but you should not be at war with him. If we are going to wait for him to acknowledge a state of war with us, we are indeed the simplest of mortals. For even if he marches straight against Attica and the Piraeus, he will not admit it, if we may judge from his treatment of the other states. For take the case of the Olenithians, 
When he was five miles from their city, he told them there must be one of two things. Either they must cease to reside in Olympus or he in Macedonia. Though on all previous occasions, when accused of hostile intentions, he indignantly sent ambassadors to justify his conduct. Again, when he was marching against the Phocians, he still pretended that they were his allies and Phocian ambassadors accompanied him on his march, and most people here at Athens contended that his passage through Thermopylae would be anything but a gain to the Thebans. And then again, quite lately, after entering Thessaly as a friend and ally, he seized Phere and still retains it, and lastly he informed those poor wretches, the people of Orius, that he had sent his soldiers to pay them a visit of sympathy in all good will, for he understood that they were suffering from acute internal trouble, and it was the duty of true friends and allies to be at their side on such occasions. And do you imagine that, while in the case of those who could have inflicted no harm, though they might perhaps have protected themselves against it, he preferred to deceive them rather than to crush them after due warning? In your case, he will give warning of hostilities, especially when you are so eagerly eager to be deceived. Impossible, for indeed he would be the most fatuous man on earth if, when you, his victims, charge him with no crime but throw the blame on some of your own fellow citizens, he should compose your mutual differences and jealousies and invite you to turn them against himself and should deprive his own hirelings of the excuse with which they put you off, saying that at any rate it is not Philip who is making war on Athens. But in heaven's name, is there any intelligent man who would let words rather than deeds decide the question, who is at peace and who is at war with him? Surely no one. Now it was Philip who at the very start, as soon as peace was concluded, before Diopithes was appointed general, before the force, now in the Cheronese, had been dispatched, proceeded to occupy Serium and Dor Doriscus, and expelled from the fort Serium and the sacred mount, the garrison which our own general had posted there. Yet what did that move of his mean? For it was peace that he had sworn to observe and let no one say, what of all this? How do any of these things concern Athens? For whether they were small things or whether they were no concern of yours, may be another question, but religion and justice, whether a man violates them in a small matter or in a great, have the same importance. Tell me now, when he sends mercenaries to the Sharonese, your claim to which has been recognised by the King of Persia and by all the Greeks, when he admits that he is helping the Cardians and writes to tell you so, what does he mean? For he says that he is not at war. But for my part, so far from admitting that in acting thus he is not observing the peace with you, I assert that when he lays hands on Megara, sets up tyrannies in Ubia, makes his way as now into Thrace, hatches plots in the Peloponnese, and carries out all operations with his armed force, he is breaking the peace and making war upon you unless you are prepared to say that men who bring up the siege engines are keeping the peace until they actually bring them to bear on the walls. But you will not admit that, for he who makes and devises the means by which I may be captured is at war with me, even though he has not yet hurled a javelin or shot a bolt. In what then consists your danger, if anything should happen? In the alienation of the Hellespont? In the control of Megara? and Euboea, by one who is at war with you, and in the defection of the Peloponnesians to his side, am I still to say that the man who brings this siege engine to bear on your city is at peace with you? So far from saying that, I date his hostility from the very day when he wiped out the Phocians. I say that you will be wise if you defend yourselves now, but if you let the opportunity pass, you will not be able to act even when you desire to. I so far dissent, Athenians, from all you councillors, that I do not think you ought to trouble yourselves now about the Cheronese or Byzantium. Help them if you will, guard them from harm, supply the troops already there with all that they require, but let your deliberations embrace all the Greek states, 
and the great danger that besets them. But I wish to tell you the grounds for my alarm about our condition, so that if my reasoning is sound, you may adopt it as your own and take forethought for yourselves, even if you refuse to take it for the others also. But if I seem to you a driveller and a dotard, neither now nor at any other time pay any heed to me as if I were in my senses. As for the fact then that Philip rose to greatness from small and humble beginnings, that the Greek states are mutually disloyal and factious, and that the increase of Philip's power in the past was a far greater miracle than the completion of his conquest now that he has already gained so much, these and all such topics on which I might expatiate I will pass over in silence. I observe, however, that all men, and you first of all, have conceded to him something which has been the occasion of every war that the Greeks have ever waged. And what is that? The power of doing what he likes, of calmly plundering and stripping the Greeks one by one, and of attacking their cities and reducing them to slavery. Yet your hegemony in Greece lasted 75 years, that of Sparta 29, and in these later times Thebes too gained some sort of authority after the battle of Leuctra. But neither to you, nor to the Thebans, nor to the Lacedaemonians did the Greeks ever yet, men of Athens, concede the right of unrestricted action or anything like it. On the contrary, when you, or rather the Athenians of that day, were thought to be showing a want of consideration in dealing with others, all felt it their duty, even those who had no grievance against them, to go to war in support of those who had been injured. And again, when the Lacedaemonians had risen to power and succeeded to your position of supremacy, and when they set to work to encroach on others and interfered unduly with the established order of things, all the Greeks were up in arms, even those who had no grievance of their own. Why need I refer to the other states? Nay, we ourselves and the Lacedaemonians, though at the outset we could not have specified any wrong at each other's hands, thought it our duty to fight on account of wrongs which we saw the other states suffering. Yet all the faults committed by the Lacedaemonians in those thirty years and by our ancestors in their seventy years of supremacy are fewer men of Athens than the wrongs which Philip has done to the Greeks in the thirteen incomplete years in which he has been coming to the top, or rather they are not a fraction of them. And this is easily proved by a short calculation. I pass over Olynthus and Methone and Apollonia and the two and thirty cities in or near Thrace all of which Philip has destroyed so ruthlessly that a traveller would find it hard to say whether they had ever been inhabited. I say nothing of the destruction of the important nation of the Phocians. But how stands the case of the Thessalonians? Has he not robbed them of their free constitutions and of their very cities, setting up petrarchies in order to enslave them, not city by city, but tribe by tribe? Are not tyrannies already established in Euboea, an island remember not far from Thebes and Athens? Does he not write explicitly in his letters, I am at peace with those who are willing to obey me? And he does not merely write this without putting it into practice, but he is off to the Hellespont. Just as before he hurried to Ambracia in the Peloponnese, he occupies the important city of Elis. Only the other day he intrigues against the Megarians. Neither the Greek nor the barbarian world is big enough for the fellow's ambition. And we Greeks see and hear all this, and yet we do not send embassies to one another and express our indignation. We are in such a miserable position, we have to in so entrenched ourselves in our different cities that to this very day we can do nothing that our interest or our duty demands. We cannot combine we cannot take any common pledge or help or friendship. But we idly watch the growing power of this man, each bent, or so it seems to me, on profiting by the interval afforded by another's ruin, taking not a thought, making not an effort for the salvation of Greece, for that Philip, like the recurrence or attack, 
of a fever or some other disease is threatening even those who think themselves out of reach of that not one of you is ignorant. I and you know this also, that the wrongs which the Greeks suffered from the Lacedaemonians or from us, they suffered at all events at the hands of true-born sons of Greece, and they might have been regarded as the acts of a legitimate son, born to great possessions, who should be guilty of some fault or error in the management of his estate. So far, he would deserve blame and reproach, yet could not be said that it was not one of the blood, not the lawful heir who was acting thus. But if some slave or superstitious bastard had wasted and squandered what he had no right to, hev to heavens, how much more monstrous and exasperating all would have called it. Yet they have no such qualms about Philip and his present conduct, though he is not only no Greek nor related to the Greeks, but not even a barbarian from any place that can be named with honour, but a pestilent knave from Macedonia, whence it was never yet possible to buy a decent slave. Yet what is wanting to crown his insolence? Not content with the destruction of cities, is he not organising the Pythian Games, the common festival of the Greeks, and if he cannot be present in person, sending his menials to act as stewards, is he not master of Thermopylae and the passes into Greece? Holding those places with his garrisons and his mercenaries, has he not the right of precedence at the oracle? ousting us and the Thessalians and the Dorians and the rest of the Amphicytons from a privilege which not even all Greek states can claim. Does he not dictate that the Thessalians, their form of government, does he not send mercenaries, some to Portmus to expel the Atrician democracy, others to Orius to set up the tyranny of Philistines? Yet the Greeks see all this and suffer it. They seem to watch him, just as they would watch a hailstorm, each praying that it may not come their way, but none making any effort to stay its course. And it is not only his outrages on Greece that go unavenged, but even the wrongs which each suffers separately, for nothing can go beyond that. Are not the Corinthians hit by his invasion of Ambracia and Lucas and Achaeans by his vow to transfer Nopactus to the Aetolians, the Thebans by his theft of Echinus, and is he not marching even now against his allies, the Byzantines? Of our own possessions, not to mention other places, is he not holding Cardia, the greatest city in the Cheronese? In spite of such treatment, we hesitate one and all, we play the coward, we keep an eye on our neighbours, distrusting one another rarer than our common foe. Yet if he treats us all with such brutality, what do you think he will do when he has got each of us separately into his clutches? What then is the cause of this? For not without reason, not without just cause, the Greeks of old were as eager for freedom as their descendants today are for slavery. There was not something, men of Athens, something which animated the mass of the Greeks, but which is lacking now something which triumphed over the wealth of Persia, which upheld the liberties of Hellas, which never lost a single battle by sea or land, something the decay of which has ruined everything and brought our affairs to a state of chaos. And what was that? It was nothing recondite or subtle, but simply that men who took bribes from those who wished to rule Greece to ruin her were hated by all, and it was the greatest calamity to be convicted of receiving a bribe, and such a man was punished with the utmost severity, and no intercession, no pardon was allowed. At each crisis, therefore, the opportunity for action, with which fortune often equips the careless against the vigilant, and those who shrink from deeds against those who fulfil their duties, could not be bought at a price from our politicians or our generals, no nor our mutual concord, nor our distrust of tyrants and barbarians, nor, in a word, any such advantage. Now, however, all these things have been sold in the open market, and in place of them we have imported vices which have infected Greece with a mortal sickness. And that are, what are those vices? Envy of the man who has succeed, secured his gains, contempt for him who confesses, 
pardon for those who are convicted, hatred for him who censures such dealings, and every other vice that goes hand in hand with corruption. For war, galleys, men in abundance, money and material without stint, everything by which one might gauge the strength of our cities, these we as a body possess today in number and quantity, far beyond the Greeks of former times, but all our resources are rendered useless, powerless, worthless by these traffickers. That this is so, you surely see for yourselves with regard to the present, and you need no evidence of mine, but that it was the opposite in the days of old, I will prove, not in my own words, but by the written record of your ancestors, which they engraved on a bronze pillar and set up in the Acropolis. It was not their own use, for without these documents their instinct was right, but it was that you might have these examples to remind you that such cases ought to be regarded seriously. Arthmius of Zelia, it says, son of Pythonax, outlaw and enemy of the people of Athens, and of their allies, himself and his family, then is recorded the reason for his punishment, because he conveyed the gold of the Medes to the Peloponnese, so runs the inscription. I earnestly implore you to consider what was the intention of the Athenians who did this thing, or what was their proud claim. They proscribed as their enemy, and the enemy of their allies, disenfranchising him and his family, a man of Zelia, one Arthmius, a slave of the great king, for Zelia is in Asia, because in the service of his master he conveyed gold not to Athens but to the Peloponnese. This was not outlawry as commonly understood, for what mattered it to a native of Zelia if he was to be debarred from a share in the common rights of Athenian citizens? But the statutes relating to murder provide for cases where prosecution for murder is not allowed, but where it is a righteous act to slay the murderer, and he shall die an outlaw, says the legislator. This simply means that anyone slaying a member of Arthmeus' family would be free from blood guilt. So our ancestors thought that they were bound to consider the welfare of all Greeks, for except on the assumption bribery and corruption in the Peloponnese would be no concern of theirs, and in chastising and punishing all whom they detected, they went so far as to set the offenders' names on a pillar. The natural result was that the Greek power was dreaded by the barbarian, not the barbarian by the Greeks, but that is no longer so, for that is not your attitude toward these and other offences. What then is your attitude? You know it yourselves. For why should you bear the whole blame when all the other Greeks are just as bad as you? That is why I assert that the present crisis calls for earnest zeal and wise counsel. What counsel? Do you want me to tell you and will you promise not to be angry? Now there is a foolish argument advanced by those who want to reassure the citizens. Philip, they say, after all, is not yet what the... Lastaeomonians were, they were masters of every sea and land, they enjoyed the alliance of the king of Persia, nothing could stand against them, and yet our city defended itself even against them and was not overwhelmed. But for my own part, while practically all the arts have made a great advance and we are living today in a very different world from the old one, I consider that nothing has been more revolutionised and improved than the art of war. For in the first place I am informed that in those days the Lacedaemonians, like everyone else, would spend the four or five months of the summer season in invading and laying waste the enemy's territory with heavy infantry and levies of citizens, and would then retire home again. And they were so old-fashioned, or rather such good citizens, that they never used money to buy an advantage from anyone, but their fighting was of the fair and open kind. But now you must surely see that most disasters are due to traitors and none are the result of regular pitched battle. On the other hand, you hear of Philip marching unchecked, not because he leads a phalanx of heavy infantry, but because he is accompanied by skirmishers, cavalry, archers, mercenaries and similar troops. 
When relying on this force, he attacks some people, that is, at variance with itself, and when, through distrust, no one goes forth to fight for his country, then he brings up his artillery and lays siege. I need hardly tell you that he makes no difference between summer and winter, and has no season set apart for inaction. Since, however, you all know this, you must take into account and not let the war pass into your own country. You must not invite catastrophe through keeping your eyes fixed on the simple strategy of your old war with the Lacedaemonians, but arrange your political affairs and your military preparations so that your line of defence may be as far away from Athens as possible. Give him no chance of stirring from his base and never come to close grips with him. For so far as a campaign is concerned, provided men of Athens we are willing to do what is necessary, we have many natural advantages, such as the nature of his territory, much of which may be harried and devastated, and countless others, but for a pitch battle he is in better training than we are. But it is not enough to adopt these suggestions, nor even to oppose him with active military measures, but both from calculation and on principle you must show your hatred of those who speak publicly on his behalf, and you must reflect that it is impossible to defeat the enemies of our city until you have chastised those who within our very walls make themselves their servants. And that, as all heaven is my witness, you will never be able to do, but you have reached such a height of folly or of madness or I know not what to call it, for this fear too has often haunted me that some demon is driving you to your doom, that from love of calumny or envy or ribaldry or whatever your motive may be, you clamour for a speech from these hirelings, some of whom would not even disclaim that title, and you derive amusement from their vituperations. This is serious enough, but there is worse to follow, for you have granted to these men more security for the pursuance of their policy than to your own defenders, yet mark what troubles are in store for those who lend an ear to such counsellors, I will mention some facts which will be familiar to you all. At Olynthus, there were two parties in the state, Philip's men, entirely subservient to him, and the patriots, striving to preserve the freedom of their countrymen, which prey ruined their country, which betrayed the cavalry, whose betrayal sealed the doom of Olynthus. The partisans of Philip, the men who, when the city was still standing, tried to defame and slander the patriotic statesmen, until the Olynthian democracy was actually induced to expel Apollonides. Now it was not at Olynthus only that this habit reduced every kind of evil result, but at Eritrea, when the democrats, ridding themselves of Plutarchus and his mercenaries, held the city together with Portsmouth. Some of them were for handing the government over to you, others to Philip. The latter, on most points, or rather on all, gained the ear of the sorely tired, tried and ill-starred Eritreans, and at last persuaded them to expel their real champions. For of course Philip, whom they fancied their ally, sent Hipponicus with a thousand mercenaries, raised the walls of Portmus, and set up three tyrants, Hipparchus, Automedon, and Clitarchus. Twice since then they have tried to deliver themselves and twice he has driven them from their homes. On the first occasion sending Eurolochus with his mercenaries and on the second Parmenio. And what need is there to mention most of the cases but at Aureus, Philistides, Menippus, Socrates, Thoas and Agepius. The very men who now control the city were, as everyone knew, Philip's agents. But Euphorius a man who once resided here in Athens was working for the freedom and emancipation of his countrymen. It would be a long story to tell you how this man was repeatedly outraged and insulted by the people, but a year before the capture of Eritrea, detecting the machination of Philistides and his party, he denounced him as a traitor. Then a number of fellows banded together with Philip for their paymaster and managing director, and dragged Euphraeus off to prison for setting the city in an uproar. When the Democrats of Aureus saw this, instead of rescuing him and knocking the others on the head, they showed no resentment against them and gloated over Euphraeus. 
saying that he deserved all he got. Then having all the liberty of action they desired, they intrigued for the capture of the city and prepared to carry out their plot, while any of the common folk who saw, who saw what they were at, were, were at were terrorised into silence. Having the fate of Euphraeus before their eyes, and so abject was their condition that, with this danger looming ahead, no one dared to breathe a syllable until the enemy, having completed their preparations, were approaching the gates, and then some were for defence, the others for surrender. But since that base and shameful capture of the city, the latter have been in its rulers and tyrants. Those who sheltered them before and had been ready to take any measures against Euphraeus were rewarded with banishment or death, and the noble Euphraeus slew himself, giving thus a practical proof of the honesty and disinterested patriotism of his opposition to Philip. Perhaps you wonder why the people of Olympus and Eretria and Orius were more favourably inclined to Philip's advocates than their, to their own? The explanation is the same as at Athens, that the patriots, however much they desire it, cannot sometimes say anything agreeable, for they are obliged to consider the safety of the state. But the others, by their very efforts to be agreeable, are playing into Philip's hands. The patriots demanded a war subsidy, the others denied it its necessity. The patriots bade them fight on and mistrust Philip. The others bade them keep the peace until they fell into the snare. Not to go into particulars, it is the same tale everywhere. One party speaking to please their audience, the other giving advice that would have ensured their safety. But at the last there were many things that the people were induced to concede, not as before for their own gratification, nor through ignorance, but gradually yielding because they thought that their discomfiture was inevitable and complete. And by heaven, that is what I certainly fear will be your experience, when you count your chances and discover that there is nothing left for you to do. And yet I pray, Athenians, and such may not be the issue of events, better to die a thousand times than pay court to Philip and abandon any of your loyal counsellors. A fine return the people of Aureus have gained by handing themselves over to Philip's friends and rejecting Euphraeus. A fine return the Democrats of Eritrea have gained for spurning your embassy and capitulating to Clitarchus. They are slaves, doomed to the whipping post and the scaffold. A fine clemency he showed to the Olympians who voted Lathenes their master of the horse and banished Apollonides. It is folly and cowardice to cherish such hopes, to follow ill counsel and refuse to perform any fraction of your duties, to lend an ear to the advocates of your enemies and imagine that your city is so great that no conceivable danger can befall it. Ay, and a disgrace too it is to have to say when all is over, why? Who would have thought it? For of course we ought to have done this or that, and not so and so. Many things could be named by the Olympians today which would have saved them from destruction, if only they had then foreseen them. Many could be named by the Orites, many by the Phocians, many by every ruined city. But of that, what use of them is that? While the vessel is safe, whether it be a large or a small one. Then is the time for sailor and helmsman, arid everyone in his turn to show his zeal and to take care. That is not capsized by anyone's malice or inadvertence, but when the sea has overwhelmed it, zeal is useless. So we too, Athenians, as long as we are safe, blessed with a very great city, ample advantages and the fairest repute, what are we to do? Perhaps some of my hearers have long been eager to ask that question. I solemnly promise that I will answer it and will also move a resolution for which you can vote if so disposed. To begin with ourselves, we must make provision for our defence. I mean with war galleys, funds and men, for even if all other states succumb to slavery, we surely must fight the battle of liberty. 
then having completed all these preparations and made our purpose clear, we must lose no time in calling upon the other Greeks, and we must inform them by sending ambassadors in every direction, to the Peloponnese, to Rhodes, to Chios, to the great king, for even his interests are not unaffected if we prevent Philip from subduing the whole country, so that if you win them over, you may have someone to share your dangers and your expenses when the time comes, or if not, that you may at least delay the course of events. For since the war is against an individual and not against the might of an organised community, even delay is not without its use. Nor were those embassies useless which you sent round the Peloponnese last year to denounce Philip, when I and our good friend Polyuctus here and Aegisippus and the rest went from city to city and succeeded in checking him, so that he never invaded Ambracia nor even started against the Peloponnese. I do not, however, suggest that you should invite the rest, unless you are ready to do for yourselves what is necessary, for it would be futile to abandon our own interests and pretend that we are protecting those of others, or to overlook the present dangers and alarm of our neighbours with dangers to come. That is not my meaning, but I do contend that we must send supplies to the forces in the Cherisonese and satisfy all their demands, and while we make preparation ourselves, we must summon, collect, instruct, and exhort the rest of the Greeks. That is the duty of a city with a reputation such as yours enjoys. But if you imagine that Greece will be saved by Chalcidians or Megarians, while you run away from the task, you are wrong, for they may think themselves lucky if they can save themselves separately, but this is a task for you. It was for you that your ancestors won this proud privilege and bequeathed it to you at great and manifold risk. But if every man sits idle, consulting his own pleasure and careful to avoid his own duty, <coughs> not only will he find no one to do it for him, but I fear that those duties that we wish to shirk may all be forced upon us at once. <coughs> These are my views and these are my proposals, and if they are carried out, I believe that even now we may retrieve our fortunes. If anyone has anything better to propose, let him speak, and otherwise, but whatever you decide, I pray heaven it may be to your advantage.